Uh, there we go. I am Claire O'Neill. I'm the director of Green Bank Observatory, and I get the uh, chance to welcome all of you guys to this workshop and talk to you a little bit about Green Bank Observatory and give you a quick overview of this. And from there, I'll hand it off to Will Armatrack to give a couple uh, logistical issues as we move forward. Uh, one thing to be aware of as you go through this, if you have questions, please uh, use your, your chat. I don't think we've got the Q&A function up right now, um, but use uh, chat or Q&A as we go forward on this. So let me uh, virtually welcome you to Green Bank Observatory. Uh, on the one hand, I'm very pleased to have so many people as part of this workshop. On the other hand, I'm very sad that you aren't here in Green Bank to get to enjoy uh, the beautiful weather we're having, as well as get a chance to actually see the telescopes and meet the staff in per person. So hopefully as this goes forward, as all of you get to start using the telescope, you will find yourself coming on site and getting a chance to meet the same people you'll see over, over Zoom and the same instruments you'll get to see over Zoom and get to see those in real life. But with that, let me go ahead and uh, move forward. And I always like to start uh, these, these introductions just with uh, the putting the mission statement of Green Bank Observatory up online. And the reason for that is to just remind all of ourselves what, what Green Bank Observatory is doing and why we're here. Of course, a large part of what we do is to provide uh, radio instrumentation and radio telescopes to the astronomy community worldwide. That's why we're having this workshop is to train people up on doing that. But another big part of what we do is the educational side, which is also part of this. So we like we reach out to everybody, both astronomers, people that are interested in becoming astronomers, as well as the general public to teach them about what we do. And with workshops like this to try to make sure that the science that comes out of the GBT is the best possible science available. So since you don't get to be here on site, I thought I would just step you through a little bit about what you would see if you came on site. The Green Bank Observatory was the original site of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And we've had world-class telescopes operating on site for more than 60 years now. The majority of the telescopes you see in these images are still up and um, maybe not all of them are running, but still up and available at least for, for viewing on site. And quite a few of them are still operational. The one exception to this, of course, is the one you see the right in the middle that was completed in 1962. That's the old 300 foot telescope that collapsed back in the late 1980s, paving the way for the uh, building of the GBT, which is what we'll be talking about for most of this workshop. The GBT, of course, you'll hear lots about it. Um, it has a fully steerable telescope. That means we can see everything but the lower 15% of the southern sky. We have uh, current frequency coverage from about 0.3 to 116 gigahertz, non-contiguous. That means we don't have receivers where the atmosphere is very opaque. On the lower end, that is just a practical limit set by the uh, science desires of the scientific community. The higher end of this, of course, is set by the atmospheric opacity up above 115 gigahertz. It makes it impractical, impractical to run the telescope at those frequencies. Uh, the telescope is absolutely phenomenal sensitivity. You'll be hearing a lot about that. We easily can push things down to the microjanskis or even lower when we need to, and equally has fantastic aperture efficiency. There's a lot of science in stone telescope. You are no skies facility. It means anybody can come in with a good idea, propose, and uh, the best ranked proposals are then scheduled for observing. But we do find that a lot of our proposals fall in about four areas. Those are fundamental physics. Uh, stellar birth and evolution, the origin of life and galaxies across cosmic time. You'll be hearing a lot about those over the next few days. Um, what's great to me are our user community and looking at our user community. So in a given five years, these statistics seem to hold true. We have about 3,000 individual scientists that have proposed to use the telescope on a rolling five-year average. Um, again, the, the types of science they want to do goes across many different areas, but very importantly, Roughly 20% of the people proposing are new every semester. So those are people like you guys that are learning to use the telescope, thinking about the science that you can possibly do. But this means we have a vibrant community on the GBT with new users and importantly, new ideas and new science that our, that our telescope can deliver. I mentioned the unblocked aperture. You'll, you'll hear about this more, I'm sure, but you can't overemphasize the importance of this with our telescope. These are two images here that you can see on your left is an image taken with a telescope with a typical um, design with you know, your three struts coming in, your receiver sitting in the middle there. And then on the right is an image from the GBT. Both of these are uh, raw data. So you can just see the big difference that you get already with the GBT with the unblocked aperture in this image. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic. 
Again, looking up at the higher frequencies, this is a um, data taken for the first time we actually observed with the GBT up at 109 gigahertz. So we put a new receiver up on there and took some data. And what you can see here is just our beam fit compared to the theoretical model. So the theoretical model are your, your volumes on this plot. And the actual data is the lines. And you can see that the beam fit is fantastic. This means that the majority of the power you're looking for is coming straight into the beam as, ex as expected. This is what allows us to have the great aperture efficiency that we have with the telescope. And then the last thing I'll mention, um, take, talking about the GBT as it is now, is to just show you again plots that you'll be seeing repeatedly over uh, different forms of this over the next few days to just show you the frequency coverage of the telescope, again, down from 0.3 gigahertz up to 116, where you've got the obvious hole at 60 gigahertz where the atmospheric capacity is too high to observe through from the ground. Um, most of the pixels that you see, most of the receivers that you see here are single pixel receivers. We do, however, have three of these multi-pixel, what we call radio cameras up on the telescope um, that are available. These allow for much more rapid mapping of an area of the sky than you would get with a single pixel. We have a number of different backends available as well that you'll be hearing about. The primary backend we use is called Vegas. And Vegas is an FPGA and GPU system that allows for both high frequency and high time resolution data, but also very wide instantaneous bandwidth coverage. So you have to play with those parameters to decide exactly what you want to look at. So that's the GBT as it is now. And that's what you're going to be hearing about a lot for the next couple of days. So what I thought I would do with the rest of my time, rather than focus on what you're going to be learning already, is to talk to you a little bit about the future of the GBT and where we want to take the telescope. So a few years ago, we've had a workshop on site where we uh, brought together a lot of the, the people interested in using the GBT, current users of the GBT, and people from the astronomy community in general to lay out a plan for where we'd like to see the Green Bank Telescope and the Green Bank Observatory go in the future. And during that meeting, we came up with a list that's fairly similar to the list that you're seeing up here. Um, the list you're seeing here has since been modified, meeting back with the community, working through the decadal survey process and other areas. But this has developed a list into what we call the uh, Green Bank Telescope in the Next Decade, or the Advanced GBT. And here we lay out the types of capabilities we would like to see, we, the community, would like to see the GBT develop to really maximize the science coming out of the telescope over the, the decade that we're currently in. So you can see they break down to, to four main areas. The first one is new capabilities, and this is both new capabilities on the GBT, things that we've never done before, as well as new capabilities across the site, looking at possible new instruments or, or redeployment of some of the existing telescopes on site. The second big area that, that um, there's interest in seeing the Green Mag Telescope develop is in what we call, again, radio cameras. These are multi-pixel systems going up onto the telescope that allow you to do just much more rapid mapping of the sky. So that means in a given amount of time, you can really cover a much larger sky area to the same sensitivity. The inverse side of that is the optimized feeds. That's where you say, you know, you really just need the single pixel. Maybe you're filling the beam. Maybe your object is small enough that one pixel will readily cover it. Um, but you want to optimize those feeds. You want to make them either to, to maximize against the science from those feeds, either through doing what you can to continue to cool the feeds and make them as sensitive as possible, <clears throat> and or looking to widen the, the bandwidth for the feeds. So certain science requires the widest possible bandwidth, and that'll again increase your sensitivity. And then finally, so underneath all of this is the idea of the infrastructure. You know, you can build the most beautiful instruments in the world, if you put them on a telescope that's not ready to handle them, that's not optimized to handle them, then you're really not making the level of progress that you ought to make. So underneath all of this is the infrastructure bits and pieces that the community felt like we really needed to focus on um, in order to maximize the science on the telescope. So that was the idea. That was the idea a few years ago that we've been working on. And now I want to step you through where we're at with this by looking at some of the new instrumentation we're in the process of developing. So the first new instrument I want to talk about is LASI. This is the Laser Active Scanning Surface Scanning Instrument. Uh, this is uh, funded through the National Science Foundation's MSIP program. And the idea here is to take a laser scanning instrument. These exist. Um, you can buy these commercially. In fact, we bought ours commercially. Put it up on the GBT to provide real-time surface corrections for the telescope. Why do you want to do this? Because the GBT is a very large steel structure. As the temperature changes, as the sun shines on it, you actually have changes in the, the GBT structure itself. And that means that you actually lose the, the theoretical um, surface that you want to have for your high frequency observing. 
So the LASI scanner is sitting there to allow us to scan the GBT surface and actually increase the number of high frequency hours we have available on the GBT. It's a fantastic idea. It seems to be working quite well. The instrument is now up on the telescope, as you can see in the bottom picture there, and we're in the process of commissioning the instrument. Other fun uh, projects we have going on right now, we have an ultra wideband feed that's in the process of being built. You can see a picture of it on the top right corner here. This is actually optimized for uh, pulsar work and for pulsar timing work. And the idea here again is to cover a very wide bandwidth. Pulsar is this way you can get the total power coming in broken up into various bands um, and really increase your overall sensitivity on the telescope. The aim of the system is to achieve about a 30 degree Kelvin system temperature across the majority of the band on average. And this instrument again is under development. We're working uh, in the process of building it and should have it done really soon. The next, uh, oops, sorry, try that again. Um, hand in hand with ultra wideband feed is this idea of digitizing the, the uh, uh, frequencies coming down, the data coming down from the telescope in particular, focusing on wideband digital systems for these uh, things like the ultra wideband feed. The idea here is even though we sit within a radio quiet zone, we are as quiet as you could possibly get in radio frequencies for the east coast of the United States. It's by no means perfect. There's still plenty of interference coming in, plenty of interference that we see with the telescope. And so our goal is, in addition to building this beautiful wideband feed, to also try to maximize the science we can get out of the, the, the data coming in on the telescope using what we call active RFI mitigation techniques. So that is you bring the system in and you actively remove the RFI from the data before the, the observer uses it. This allows you to get, again, increase the sensitivity of the signal that you're seeing. This project is actually, uh, the, Ryan Lynch is the PI on this project. It's a primarily a research project to understand the, how we can implement this uh, active RFI mitigation. And if all goes well, it will then be implemented onto the ultra wideband receiver that I was just talking about. So these go hand in hand with each other. Then moving again, looking into the infrastructure side of things, one of the areas that is uh, uh, of big interest to all of astronomy is reuse of data. That is going back into data archives as you get a telescope that's been around for a while and using the archival data to actually do science. This is something that is getting more and more common as, as accessibility to archival data increases and something that to be frank is not particularly easy to do with the GBT right now. Uh, the two reasons it's not easy to do with the GBT right now is first the access tool itself has had some issues that we're working on cleaning up but second, we don't archive all of the open skies data on the GBT. We only archive that data that's not very, that's not incredibly high time resolution data. Uh, the reason we don't archive it is simply we haven't had the ability to do so. We haven't had the physical space to put the data. And just last year, the National Science Foundation gave us funding through the Windows on the Universe program to build a data archive building and facility for all of the GBT open skies data. So that is about to begin construction. As soon as the uh, snow and ice is cleared off the ground, we'll start construction on that building. And this will allow us to archive all Open Skies GBT data. So it doesn't matter how high the time resolution is, how wide the bandwidth is, we'll be archiving all of this. Hand in hand, we're working with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory to um, improve their archive access tool and develop it so that it can be fully used for GBT data. So then you'll have an easy path into the data as well as access to all of the data out there, allowing for full access to GBT archival data. So that building itself should be in place by the end of this calendar year. Um, completion of the archive access tool in its current phase should also be done by then, starting the, the process then of archiving all GBT data. And then continuing to look at the different instrumentation we have on site. One of the other areas that was talked about was trying to optimize the receivers that we have and in going, working with the community to try to understand the best, uh, the best bang for the buck, essentially, in terms of receivers, the clear case with our X-band receiver, it, it is a fantastic receiver. However, it was clear the technology existed to make something much, much better than what we currently have. So we are in the process of replacing the current GBT X-band receiver. It's sitting up at the Gregorian Focus. Um, in the process, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to increase the overall frequency range of this instrument. So we're actually almost doubling the frequency range. It's currently 8 to 10 gigahertz, and it'll go all the way up to 12 gigahertz. 
We're increasing the cooling capacity on it, which means less downtime for this receiver. And we're also improving the baseline stability of this instrument, which was a, a request from quite a few of the observers using the GBT. This instrument's in the shop. It's been a little bit delayed because of COVID and some of the slow work slowdowns inherent in the, the current COVID pandemic situation. But nonetheless, we plan on commissioning this instrument this calendar year and having it up hopefully available for users uh, no later than early in 2022. So finally, taking a look a little bit away from the GBT on some of the other areas that we're, we're looking at expanding, this is an exciting new project that the telescope is involved in, which is to, uh, working with the CHIME group on putting an outrigger antenna onto the Green Bank, Green Bank site. So the CHIME array is an array of uh, these, these fantastic telescopes up in, China, up, in, up in Canada that you can see. Um, where you, the, the picture in the top left picture shows the actual chimery up in, in uh, Canada, up in Penticton. And it's used for a number of different science experiments, both uh, detecting fast radio bursts as, whether, as well as looking up at uh, the epoch of reionization to try to measure that. But one of the things they found with their experiments, particularly with the FRB experiments, is that while well, they're fantastic at detecting them, when all of your array is in one location, it's more difficult to actually pinpoint where in the sky you're seeing those, those bursts. And so we've recently signed a contract with the CHIME team to lay one of the large antennas here on site in Green Bank that will work simultaneously with them. So when an FRB is detected with the CHIME array as well as with the outrigger, we'll be able to much better, as I said, pinpoint in the sky where that FRB is. So that's a fantastic new experiment that, again, is just waiting for the uh, the snow and ice to go away so we can start laying the concrete for the foundations and hopefully get that instrument on site and up and running this summer. So all of the, the projects I just talked about, I know it's been a big run, hopefully you'll hear more about them over the next couple of weeks, are projects that are fully funded, under contract and underway. I do want to mention a couple more projects that are not fully funded yet, but are still the highest priorities of the kind of the next, next projects on our list. Uh, the first one is a whole new area that Green Bank has really not been involved in before, which is in radar systems. Up until very recently, uh, the Green Bank telescope has been a purely uh, receive-only telescope. That means that we happily receive signals from um, astronomical objects, but we could even receive signals, uh, man-made signals, for example, the Arecibo telescope or the Goldstone telescope out in California could transmit a signal, a transmit uh, the radar signal, up, bounce it off of something, and then the GBT would be able to receive that signal. That's been fantastic, and working with them on bi-static uh, radar observations and continuing to work with the Goldstone system is something we wish to do. However, for many years now, we've also been talking with the planetary radar community about the possibility of putting a transmit system on the GBT itself. And over the past few years, changes in technologies as well as some changes with the operations of the Green Bank Telescope and a few other telescopes have made it such that it's time now to develop a new radar transmit system for the GBT. So last year, in about January, February of last year, we kicked off the idea of putting a transmit system up onto the telescope itself. And the idea was uh, in phase one to just get an existing transmitter, put it up on the telescope and do a demonstrator project where the GBT transmits, and in this case, the VLBA antennas receive that signal. Now we could process the signal, make sure everything works. If everything works very well, we would then move on to a phase two project, which would be to put together plans for a much higher powered system onto the GBT. Again, using initially the VLBA antennas as the receive, but ultimately when the NGVLA is built, being able to use some, or potentially if the science calls for it, even all of the NGVLA antennas, as a receive antennas for the system. So that was the idea. Uh, as I said last uh, around January, February, we started on this uh, phase one low power system. And uh, in spite of the pandemic, managed to pull it off and put the uh, test system, which was about a 700 watt system up onto the GBT in November of 2020 and uh, transmitted a number of different targets, but one of them was the Apollo 15 landing site and the image you see here is the data um, where it was simply received by one of the VLBA antennas. So this is acting with just the GBT transmitting and the VLBA Hancock antenna receiving the signal and processing that data. And already you can see just fantastic resolution. This is five meter resolution data. 
Uh, during this experiment, we did actually receive with uh, eight of the VLBA antennas, and that, that is continuing to be processed to actually combine those images together. And we're planning on doing another demonstration run next month, the targets of which are still under discussion with some of the Green Bank staff and some of our partners with uh, Raytheon and NRAO. But overall, the, that phase one system worked extremely well. And we're now moving on to phase two, which will be development of the high power radar system on the GBT. The goal here is to build something up in the kilowatt and anywhere from 50 to a few hundred kilowatts on the GBT. Again, the GBT transmitting the VLBA and NGVLA receiving. We're in the project planning phase of that right now. Um, this is not yet funded, although we're working with a number of organizations to work on the funding for that. And we're hopeful within the next few years, you'll begin to, you'll see the first of these high power transmit systems up on the telescope and really bring the planetary uh, radar community a few steps forward in terms of their capabilities. And then the last instrument I want to mention, hopefully, is uh, the Argus 144 or Argus Plus instrument. It's now called. I haven't updated this to the, to the new algorithm for that. So this is looking again at the radio cameras end of things and trying to understand what the next big leap for radio cameras on the GBT is. Um, we currently have a 16 pixel uh, camera up on the GBT that works from 85 to 116 gigahertz. It was a prototype array. The idea is we want to expand that now up to around 144 pixels up on the telescope. And it would be an absolutely fantastic mapping instrument for all sorts of different science, uh, working again up at those frequency ranges. Uh, you can see the statistics up here of what you would get in terms of pixel spacing and initial footprint on the instrument. Um, the project is not funded yet, but we're really quite hopeful and we have quite a few community members working with us on this. Um, we have applied to the NSF MSIP program to get this underway. Uh, the proposal to the NSF MSIP program would actually be to fund us to do all the R&D. So we're 100% ready to go just into the build on this instrument. But it's a very exciting idea and a very exciting instrument. And we're quite hopeful that over the next couple of years, we'll get to see this go under development. Phew. Okay, so I just stepped you guys through a whole slew of different instruments, different ideas, different technologies going on in the telescope. I just want to re-remind you where all of this came from. All of this came from community feedback from people like you guys stepping in, talking to us about what your science is and what your interests are. <clears throat> so all that community feedback led us to this great, this great plan that we developed before 2020, a few years before, that kind of laid out the path we wanted to go down. And what I just showed you is where we are on that path. So we're making incredible progress in almost all of these areas, um, really trying to step in and develop instrumentation where the community sees that they want it, develop the infrastructure that the community sees. And we're really making a lot of effort to try to hit all of those areas and make progress. You can see we haven't hit every single area. There's a couple of these boxes that we aren't able to show that we've, we've marked off. And the reason for that is not interest or desire. We absolutely think these are fantastic areas to go in, but ultimately resources. We only have so many people on site to, to put attention to these instruments. And so we simply have to to limit ourselves eventually on what we can do. But all of these are moving forward. Many of these instruments will be underway or will be completed within the next couple of years. And that allows us to start thinking about the plans for where we're gonna go and what we're gonna do next. So what is next? Like I said, we've got lots of great things under development, <clears throat> lots of new capabilities coming with the next year to the next few years. And then after that, we have to continue to think about Green Bank Observatory Green Bank Telescope's role within the area of all era of the new telescopes coming online. SKA has made some pretty big announcements over the last um, few months. NGVLA is certainly hopeful to be moving forward. The GBT clearly has roles within these instruments. We just have to continue to make sure we're developing our plans within those roles. Um, some of the ideas include the NGVLA is certainly discussing putting a, a Green Bank Observatory as one of the NGVLA antenna sites. Uh, we are working with the NGVLA group to also try to understand what role there is for the GBT within the NGVLA itself in terms of its high sensitivity capabilities, its spacing, and as I already mentioned within the, the radar project as well, working with the GBT potentially as a transmit and then the, the NGVLA is, or parts of the NGVLA is the receive system. But what I want to end with here before I look at the questions is just to, to reemphasize that the long-term GBT future is really up to all of you guys. Um, the GBT was built for the astronomy community. All of the plans, all of the instrumentation that I talked about is coming from that community, from the ideas of people that want to use our telescope and want to maximize 
science I can get out of the telescope and often want to turn the telescope into a direction where they really see new scientific areas. So community input is the basis for all of our long-term goals and all of our instrumentation. And as all of you start thinking about using the GBT and start to, to use it, think about your ideas, I strongly encourage you to work with the Green Bank Observatory staff and say, you know, what if you did this? What if we had this new instrumentation? And help us continue to plan the GBT so that we're sure we're meeting the, the community's scientific goals for the very long term. So with that, I will stop and say thank you and go and uh, turn my attention to the uh, chat here. All right, so let me uh, work my way down through the uh, chat window, try to get through as many questions as I possibly can. Uh, so the first question here is, uh, how would the GBT work with the NGVLA, given that the NGVLA will be located in the Southwest and Greenback Observatories in West Virginia? Um, will it be part of VOBI? So the answer to that is yes. So if you, if you look at the overarching plans for the NGVLA, I'm not an NGVLA scientist, so I'll do my best. The NGVLA has a concept of this core in the Southwestern United States, but in practice that beyond that, the NGVLA um, will actually have these uh, arrays of antennas spread out across the United States. And so the Green Bank site would be one of those, one of those facilities. So that's the idea, um, and that is actually, if you look at the overarching NGVLA plan, that's what you'll see within it. For the radar itself, it would be a by system. So the idea is the, NGV, or the GBT would be transmitting and then the signal received by the, by the NGVLA. Next question in the list, what is needed to improve the data processing tools? Is there a way to join conversations about that work? Um, that's a fantastic question. And um, hang on one second and I'll answer it. Sorry, that's one of the joys of working from home here. Um, so one of the, uh, the way to answer that one is what is needed to improve the data processing tools? It's a good question. There's been a number of communications with the community about what the next correct step would be to go. And in fact, we had a survey out to the community not too long ago the two big ideas, one is porting the tools, which uh, primarily exist within IDL over to Python. The other idea is to develop better pipelines. For the pipelines right now, we're focused on our new instrumentation to get there. Um, the port over to Python is something we would love to see happen. We are extremely resource limited and that's the only reason it's not moving forward. Um, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to talk to some of the scientists as you're working with them on your experiments over the next few days about the possibilities and uh, we're happy to, to work with the community on that. And then let me see if I can get through these really fast. Um, next question is, should we always be referring to the GBT as GBO and proposals, et cetera? Ah, good question. The GBT is a Green Bank Telescope. So that is the instrument that we talk about. Green, GBO is Green Bank Observatory. So that is not just that one telescope, but the other seven telescopes on site, our educational programs, our machine shops, and everything else. So the instrument is the telescope, the observatory is everything much more than the telescope. And finally, what is the last question? And my, I'm running over because we're supposed to be able to talk, but that's okay. Um, can the older antennas be recommissioned or are they too obsolete? The answer to that question is yes. Um, so we have some antennas on site that are absolutely able to be reused. We have a 20 meter telescope that's in active use, a 140 foot diameter telescope that could easily be recommissioned as well as a um, a couple other telescopes. We also have some older telescopes, the 385 foot antennas that would be challenging to refurbish and uh, might be a bit more work to do. So we have some ready to go and some that would probably be uh, uh, more expensive to refurbish than might be worthwhile, but that's difficult to say. So with that, I'm gonna thank you guys again. Apologize for Will for running over a little bit and hand this off to Will to talk a bit more about the practicalities of all this. No worries at all. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, if you do have any other questions about GBT capabilities, feel free to ask them throughout and we will, we will attempt to answer them. So I have just a couple logistical items to go through and then we will get into David Freyer talking more in depth about the GBT's capabilities. So if you are on site, this would be the first slide that I would show you and I would say, welcome to the Green Bank Observatory. Here, we're still welcoming, welcoming you to the Green Bank Observatory, but in virtual format. Uh, we are hopeful that you will visit us in person one day whenever our uh, site reopens to the public. Uh, it's 
it's sort of a wonderful playground, not just for radio astronomy, but for hiking and biking and all those fun things. So there is also a 20% off coupon in your informational email that the our visitor center has asked me to share with you. So if you would like any Green Bank Observatory swag, we can get it for you at a discount there. Our goals for the workshop are for you to become familiar with the GBT observing modes and user interfaces, and for you to practice uh, some standard data reduction techniques. Really the main goal here is for you to learn how to observe remotely to give you the confidence and the tools to be able to execute your programs uh, as best as you possibly can uh, with plenty of support from our staff here in Green Bank. So you'll observe remotely, but again, we do hope you come visit us in person one day. Our schedule for today and tomorrow runs 10 a.m. to 30 p.m. with some lectures and observation prep. So we'll be on this Zoom channel for all of those things. And then this evening, we will have group observations. And tomorrow evening, we will have some more group observations. For those, you won't be on this Zoom link. You'll be on an individual channel that has been assigned to your observing group. The links for those were in the email that I um, sent you last week. If you just go to your individual observing group page, the link is right, right there. So your project friend will help to clarify this some more uh, if, if it needs to be clarified. But again, we will be on this channel for lectures during the day and those other channels for observations at night. On Wednesday, the schedule is a little bit different. It's just the morning. We want to give you some time to go over your data from the night before. And then we'd like to go through some really informal project presentations. If you've seen some cool things, show them to us, right? You don't have to have any sort of formal presentation, but we just want to go through everything together. And so it doesn't necessarily have to last uh, until 1230, but basically just until we, we get through everyone's projects. Then on Wednesday afternoon, we'll have some optional Argus training from 1230 to 130. This is really more if you are interested in the high frequency observing, there are some special considerations for projects above say 50 gigahertz. Hopefully you've seen this schedule, uh, the link to it is in the email I sent out this morning, as well as last week. Um, if you have any questions about the schedule, feel free to ask me. And there are some other helpful tabs along the bottom that'll point you towards those individual group observing pages that I mentioned. As far as observing accounts, if we have a new account processed for you, I will send you the information uh, for how to access that over Zoom later on this morning or early afternoon. Otherwise, your project friend will be able to open up a remote session for you. And so we have a whole connections workshop here uh, as the last lecture today. Andrew Seymour will be walking you through some of that. Those are all the logistics that I have. Uh, feel free to send me an email or a direct message on Zoom if you have anything else. It looks like there's one thing here in the chat. Um, this is more of a question for Karen, although I guess I could, I could attempt to answer it too. How is the protection from radio interference ensured as is claimed uh, that the Green Bank Observatory is located in a national radio quiet zone? So there are a few different layers of protection on site if you are within about a mile of the telescope, there are no electronics allowed. Um, that's, the, that's the strictest level of protection. There's also a West Virginia radio quiet zone that is within 10 miles of the observatory. And that's more for personal transmitting devices. So if you have a Wi-Fi router uh, very near the telescope, that's off limits. Uh, we, we would ask you to, uh, to not have those devices, for instance. And then the National Radio Quiet Zone is 13,000 square miles. That is more for commercial transmitters. So if you are a cell phone company and you want to erect a cell phone tower 
somewhere in the national radio quiet zone, you put an application to Green Bank and we will run propagation models to see if the signal from that cell phone tower would interfere with the telescope. So we would run our own models and make a recommendation as to whether that project should move forward. The National Radio Quiet Zone is really just for commercial entities and those other smaller quiet zones are for individuals. Uh, so Ryan Lynch has raised his hand. Yeah, I was just gonna add a little bit to that if, if you don't mind, Will. Yeah, please. Yeah, so the one, one important thing to know is that the Radio Quiet Zone regulations only apply to fixed transmitters. So mobile transmitters like people's individual cell phones, car radar systems, something like that um, are not covered by the National Radio Quiet Zone. There are, like Will said, there are stricter regulations uh, in place around the immediate area of the observatory at the state level. Um, Although it's you know, a little bit difficult to enforce some of those in practice if someone just comes driving through with a car radar. Um, and the other thing, and, and so because they're fixed transmitters only in the radio quiet zone, um, this does not apply to satellite systems. So we still do see satellite RFI. Um, and there's not really anything can be done about that as well as aircraft um, in some cases. Uh, and then just the other thing is that interference has a very particular definition uh, in this context, as radio astronomers, we tend to talk about just about anything that we're not interested in scientifically is interference. It's certainly anything that's terrestrial in origin. Um, but legally, interference um, to be labeled as interference or something which is interfering with the operations of the observatory uh, it has to go above certain power density thresholds, which uh, vary with um, different frequencies, et cetera. Um, so even so, so something could be compliant, but still be visible in telescope data. Um, and that's why we need to remain vigilant and also come up with um, the, you know, the best ways that we can to try and make sure that we're still able to extract good data, even in the presence of those types of signals. Thanks, Ryan. And the last question here is, is there a link for the workshop's presentation materials? Yes, I will send around the link uh, here. They'll live on our remote training portion of the website. And so we'll have PDFs of each of our presentations as well as the videos from this workshop. Uh, I won't have them on necessarily before the talk, but they'll be available afterwards. So with that, I will stop sharing.